let's get on, I get on to the broadcasting now, 1927 I did my first broadcast, 52 years ago, when I was three. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was at Savoy Hill, and I was going to sing a song, and the producer, John Sharman, I bet a lot of you remember his name, he did most of the, the music hall broadcasts, I was going to sing a song, and John said, you can't sing that song. I said, why not? He said, because it makes reference and it takes the mickey out of the clergy. I said, well, there's nothing wrong with it. He said, you're not going to do it. But time has marched on, ladies and gentlemen, and things have eased off a bit, so just for the hell of it, I'm going to sing you this song, which is a warning to all forgetful people. And it is called, That Reminds Me Where I Left My Umbrella. Young Gus Johnson, absent-minded fellow, every day he loses his umbrella. One day Gus stood a wondering, wondering where the dickens he had left the thing. Josh Brown saw him, took him aside. You're down in the mouth, said Josh. Down in the mouth, young Gus replied, and he smiled and said, by gosh. That reminds me of where I left me umbrella. Left me umbrella last night. Last night my wife started into row and I had to stop her mouth up in the old house. You say I look down in the mouth, you know, Josh, I think you're right, yeah. That reminds me of where I left me on the rail. Left me on the rail last night. Old Sam Simpson walked into a chapel. Heard the tale how Adam ate the apple. Seems that the parson saw his face and preached a little sermon that would suit his case. When he read the commandments out, I guess Sammy went all red. But oh, he looked just like five cents. When old black parson said, Oh, dearly beloved brethren, yea, it is wrong for a man to go to another man's house and eat his victuals. Verily, it is wrong for a man to go to another man's house and drink his whiskey. Yea, it is wrong for a man to go to another man's house and kiss his wife. And Simpson got up in a hurry, and the parson said, Oh, brother, why do you not tarry a little longer? Does that remind you of your evil past? Does that remind you of some wicked sin? And Simpson said, No, sir. That reminds me where I left me umbrella. <laughs> Goodbye, parson. Don't be vexed. And thank you very much for your beautiful text. Thou shalt not kiss another man's wife. I think you're right. That reminds me where I left me umbrella. Left me umbrella last night. <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. They're talking about the BBC. I must tell you, I was coming out of broadcasting house one day with my old mate Dickie Murdoch, and there were a couple of workmen sitting on the pavement with their legs stretched out having their dinner, <laughs> their dinner. And as I stepped over their legs, you see, I heard one of them say to the other, Harry, I don't know what my old woman gave me for dinner today, but I didn't know, or, uh, eh, eh. <laughs> Cause what he really meant was I really shouldn't have eaten it. At least he should have remembered he was outside the BBC and talked properly. <laughs> but I said to Dickie, if that's not a cue for a song, well, I don't know what. So I went home and put it all down on paper, and here it is. Thank you, brother. I'm a funny kind of fella in a funny kind of way. I don't mean laughing funny, I mean peculiar, as they say. I'm what my friends and relatives call rather weak inside. And although I know I've got to eat some food I can't abide, I had some jam on kippers once and had to go to bed. And when the doctor, he came round, what do you think he said? Well, you didn't, oh, well, eh, eh. that's what the doctor said. I didn't, oh, eh, eh, I answered from my bed. He said, you do that again, young man, I'm sure you will regret it. Eating jam on kippers, no, you didn't. Oh, well, <laughs> you in a minute, you uh, I once went to the derby to see the horses run. And there I saw a fairground, I thought I'd have some fun. I saw some freaks and waxworks and acrobats on boards, and a little bloke in coloured tights, he said he swallowed swords. Well, I had a friend of mine with me, a bloke they called Jim Mullet. He said, I'll do that. Grabbed a sword and shoved it down his... 
right. I knew you'd try it. Try it. Well, he didn't know, and the bloke didn't half get mad. He said he didn't know, that's the only sword I had. I said, well, if you want it back, I'm afraid you'll never get it, because it never had no handle on. He didn't. Oh, no. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And now, I come to the turning point in my professional life. The beginning of the war. Perhaps you don't know that uh, no live artists were used down at Bristol, where the BBC had moved. And then one day, I was walking down the main street at Bristol, and I met Charlie Shadwell. Remember Charlie Shadwell? It was such a big success with Tommy Hanley. And, uh, oh, he said, I've been looking for you. I said, why? He said, well, the BBC have accepted a show of mine called Garrison Theatre, which I did in the first war, and we're looking for somebody to be a funny soldier. So, this is the chance that I've been waiting for all my life. Clear the gallery, let a fella through, let a fella through. What, what are you doing down there? I don't get it. Well, as I say, we did this uh, first one on December the 9th, and it was overrunning. And Harry Pepper, who was on the left hand side, I mean the right hand side of the picture there, sent a message through to me don't do the letter, Brother Sid's letter, this one. Don't do the letter, just do the monologue. And for the first time in my life with the BBC, I disobeyed orders. I did the letter and not the monologue. And overnight, it was really fantastic, the letters I had about this thing. And I've got one here, just as an example. And I'm going to read it till now, see if it brings back any memories. My dear Jack, must be some years now since I wrote to you, but the missus ran off with a lodger in 1945 <laughs> and took the pencil with her. <laughs> she had always been threatening to leave me, but it was some time before I could get her to promise. The lo lodger was a nice chap, though, only he took my darts. However, the missus came back again last week, which was a good thing, as there was quite a lot of washing up accumulated in four years. <laughs> Ivy and Herbert have just had another baby under the new scheme, and they asked me to go along and see the little stranger. They asked me what I thought it was, and I got it in three guesses. <laughs> Our cousin Elf, who was a commercial traveller, is now travelling in ladies' underwear, and he done half look silly. <laughs> Fancy Cousin Ethel getting married. We all thought she was past it. She was, but she must have decided to come back for it. <laughs> I think that is all the news now, except to tell you that we have moved into a new house next to the glue factory. So there is always a horrible smell from your loving brother, Sid. <laughs> P.S. I'm waiting to put the cat out, but she hasn't come in yet. <laughs> well, as I say, it was during our uh, beginning of the uh, Garrison Theatre that I uh, had to uh, start writing things. And one week, Harry Pepper and Charlie Shedd, well, we always had a little meeting, and he said, uh, have you got any other monologues? I said, well, I've got a, 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 what I call funny occupations. Now, I really ought to tell you about the job I got, because to look at me, you wouldn't think it true. I don't look like a fellow that has to be hard-hearted. Well, I'm not, <coughs> but this is what I have to do. I'm a bloke what bungs up rat holes. I am really. I'm a rat hole bunger-upper, too, and all. And when I speak of rat holes, I don't mean babies' rat holes. I'm in olds, what's poured by rats right through the wall. 
I've had and heard some narrow squeaks in my time, though I don't look brave or very fond of strife, till all the time there's rat holes, they'll be bungers up a rat hole. So it looks as though I've got a job for life. That was the very first one. <laughs> Now, there's a, there's a plaster molders yard of Alamar from here. Well, my old Uncle Teddy has a job that may sound queer. It really is quite different to what other people do, but it really is a clever job. I am not a kidding of you. Because he's a caster up of alabaster plaster. <laughs> now, don't get me mixed up with this one, whatever you do. <laughs> he's an alabaster plaster caster. <laughs> And it doesn't mix with water, common powder into mortar. For an alabaster plasterer, it's he. Now, if he were merely mixing for cementing, he would stir it in a mixer as of old. But to prove his cast, this master cast his plaster alabaster in an alabaster plaster caster's mortar.